health outcomes, changes due to interventions. To bring positive change, patient experiences and health must both improve. Healthcare costs must be lowered, and clinician and staff burnout has to end. But our problems are big. 133 million Americans have at least one chronic disease. Half a million people are dying every year from hospital errors, injuries, and infection. The shortage of primary care professionals will be as much as 100,000 in just the next five years. Big problems require bigger solutions. Positive change needs acceleration. It needs to happen now. But these are not so easy solutions that many don't want to hear, and even few are willing to talk about. How to lead such a change? How to discover, discuss, and disrupt healthcare to make a difference now? This is Vitals, visionary health leadership in action. Good afternoon and welcome to Vitals. My name is John Langell, president of Northeast Ohio Medical University. We're thrilled to be able to welcome you today for yet another version of Vitals, where we will discuss some of the nation's biggest healthcare problems and how current leaders are using the Vitals tools, value, innovation, technology, advocacy, leadership, and service to lead transformative change in healthcare. We're incredibly honored to be joined today by Rita Horwitz, the president and CEO of Better Health Partnership, a multi-stakeholder regional health improvement collaborative located in Northeast Ohio that accelerates data-informed improvements in equitable population and community health. She has grown through the ranks at Better Health Partnership over the last 11 years, having served as Director of Business Development, Chief Operating Officer, and now President and CEO. During Rita's tenure, she expanded the Collaborative's community partner to include healthcare, social services, public health, business, payers, education, and other sectors across multiple counties. A graduate of Ohio State University's School of Nursing and the Case Western Reserve University's Healthcare Education Management Program, Ms. Horwitz has held leadership positions in ambulatory healthcare, corporate-based health and wellness, business development, quality improvement, and many others. She also serves as the executive representative to the National Network for Regional Health Improvement Collaboratives, Ohio Pathway Hub Network, the Carmela Rose Health Foundation Board of Directors, United Ways Community Advisory Board, and numerous other impactful community-focused organizations. Amongst her many accolades, she received recognition in Crane's Cleveland Business as one of Northeast Ohio's most notable women in healthcare in 2018, and as a graduate of Leadership Cleveland's class of 2019. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Rita Horwitz. Well, thank you for that warm introduction, long introduction. I really appreciate that. Um, and good afternoon, everybody. It's certainly a pleasure to be with you today. And thanks for inviting me to share more about our Regional Health Improvement Collaborative work here in Northeast Ohio, and the many ways that our partners are working to advance uh, health value across the region. And just to make sure that we're aligned on what we mean by health value, um, what we're talking about here is the healthcare dollars that are spent in relation to both the safety and the quality of care received and the health outcomes achieved with populations served by our health systems here in Northeast Ohio. But before I jump into sharing more information about our work, let me just begin by saying that even though I have been working in the business of collaboration for over 11 years, my friends and family still often come up to me and say, you know, Rita, I still don't really understand what it is you do for a living. <laughs> and so sometimes I just smile at them and say, that's okay. Some days I don't either. So, <laughs> so that's quite all right. What I'm saying here is that collaborating for a healthier community can take many various shapes and sizes on any given day. And sometimes it can be a bit messy. So if within the next 17 minutes that I am allotted for this talk, I am successful with explaining what our collaborative model is all about, but more importantly, 
helping you understand why it is so vital to a community and you walk away fully understanding it and you wanna learn more and you wanna engage in collaboration for your community, then I will consider this thought leadership session a true success. So one reason uh, that I say our work is so challenging to explain to others, you know, relates to this ever-changing landscape in health and healthcare. You know, our partners that we collaborate with, they have to stay in lockstep with these landscape changes. Um, these are often catalyzed, as you know, by changes or incentives in the payment and the reimbursement system, right? And they also have to ensure that they continuously meet the needs of the patients and the communities that they serve. So therefore, over the years, we have aligned our collaborative priorities to remain relevant to them and to add value to our stakeholders. In the beginning, our work was focused on promoting uh, electronic medical record adoption in primary care just to enable transparency and meaningful use of information to accelerate improvements in quality of care delivery. Then we evolved to help our partners adopt the patient-centered medical home model that I know many of you are familiar with and to help them get recognized by NCQA. And then we experienced this fundamental shift to uh, away from fee-for-service and towards value-based healthcare and payment. This offered a ton of innovative opportunities, new payment models, new ways to engage with primary care. And we were very instrumental in helping to shape what was or later became the Comprehensive Primary Care Initiative, otherwise known as CPC and CPC Plus. And then more recently, we've been bridging clinical care with community resources to address social determinants of health as a way for our providers to help their patients get to better health outcomes. One great example of remaining flexible and adaptable to changing priorities was of course the rapid pivot that our partners as well as the rest of the world had to do when the global pandemic hit us in 2020. So many people had to reset their priorities just to help people remain healthy and out of the hospital and to stabilize our economy. Locally here, Better Health Partnership was quickly called upon to convene several federally qualified health centers in the region, together with hospitals, payers, public health, the government and faith-based communities to ensure equitable access to COVID-19 testing and vaccinations for minority populations living in low-income neighborhoods. As many of you know, these individuals were disproportionately impacted by COVID, experiencing higher rates of hospitalization and death than other populations. Results of this collaboration were so impressive in reaching these individuals and exceeding the vaccine uptake rate that we predicted, they were recognized by several local news channels and published in the New York Times. But a message I want you to hear loud and clear is that collaboration doesn't only need to happen when there is a crisis. We've been doing this work for 15 years now. So working collectively can be useful when complex community health needs exist, but also persist in a community and where diverse stakeholders wanna share responsibility and they wanna invest their time, their talent and their treasure to resolve these issues together. These I would tell you in my mind are the first two conditions needed to move forward with collaboration. So one of our most challenging and persistent health value issues in the United States that many of you can relate to is the disconnect we see between our so-called world-class healthcare, but our not so world-class health outcomes we experience. We spend far more on healthcare than any other country in the world, close to 20% of our GDP. Yet the life expectancy of Americans is trending downward and it's shorter than in other, in other developed countries. And we suffer higher death rates than other countries for things like smoking, obesity, homicides, opioid overdoses, suicides, road accidents, and infant deaths. In Ohio, where our collaborative is located, we rank 47th out of 50 states on health value, according to the Health Policy Institute of Ohio's Health Value Dashboard. This means that Ohioans are living less healthy lives and yet spending more on health care than people in most other states across the country. 
there is as much as a 29 year gap in life expectancy between cities in Ohio, 29 years. And this is mainly due to social factors. Things like lack of access to healthy food or poor walkability in their neighborhoods, struggles with addiction, chronic disease, exposure to air quality, poor air quality, and sparse investments in public health and prevention across the state. And sadly, we're seeing widening disparities in health outcomes from infants to adults by race, ethnicity, income, and insurance. And we've learned here locally, at least, that no one organization or no one sector alone can solve these complex issues. So for these reasons and more since 2007, Better Health Partnership has provided the structure, the processes, the tools, the data, the neutral convening, all those things necessary to foster a culture of trusted collaboration in Northeast Ohio among our many diverse stakeholders. This includes 18 member health systems from across 17 counties, along with seven federally qualified health centers that service the safety net population. We bring these health systems together with social care agencies, Medicaid managed care plans, employers, public health department schools, universities, and many community-based organizations like the Greater Cleveland Food Bank and United Way 211. They work together to accelerate improvements in equitable population and community health. We're very, very intentional about upholding guiding principles that ensure a safe space for trusted collaboration and innovation to occur, even when we bring competing organizations to the table. Our partners work together to prioritize their own shared agendas and align their resources to collectively improve health value across the region, and they use actionable data to inform their efforts. So Better Health Partnership collects electronic uh, medical record data from these health systems, and we combine that with other data sources available to us from public health, from payers, from social service agencies, to help inform their strategies and to monitor progress. We use what we call a positive deviance approach to find bright spots in that data that may indicate a best practice. And then we promote the sharing of those best practices when we find them so that we can further spread and scale what works. And sometimes we, we disseminate those best practices through sort of intimate, small shared learning circles. And other times we bring 200 people together uh, in a room for a whole day with our learning collaboratives that are held regionally, as well as at a statewide level. We often say that Better Health Partnership provides the infrastructure, the technical expertise, and the leadership needed to help a rising tide lift all boats across the region. And we proudly have documented some examples of how we have lifted all boats across the region, particularly with our adult population health improvement work. This has been widely recognized and nationally published. So through neutral convening, spreading best practices, informed by data, our partners have significantly reduced racial and ethnic disparities in diabetes care, closing gaps in this care by as much as 20% between African-American populations, white and Hispanic populations. They've improved blood pressure control for nearly 100,000 adults, including all subpopulations by race, ethnicity, income, and insurance. In over six years, they saved approximately $40 million from nearly 6,000 averted hospitalizations of ambulatory care sensitive cardiovascular related conditions in Cuyahoga County. And this was noted in an independent study that was published in Health Affairs in February of 2018. But even though we have experienced significant wins here that we're very proud of in Northeast Ohio, we know we still have a very long way to go. So until no more infants are dying before their first birthday, before suicide is no longer the leading cause of death in Ohio's children ages 10 to 14, until adult life expectancy gaps are closed across the state, and until people no longer avoid getting the health care they need due to access or affordability, we'll continue to foster a culture of collaboration for health and health value here in Northeast Ohio. 
In closing, I would say to you, complex health issues in a community cannot be solved in silos. Trusted collaboration led by invested stakeholders supported by a strong backbone organization and actionable data works. We've proven it. And I invite you to think about if the high returns that we've experienced here in Northeast Ohio with our collaborating partners could be replicated across all communities, can you imagine the difference we could make for hundreds of thousands of people served by the healthcare systems across America? And not just in times of crisis, but rather continuously working together to create a culture of health and to improve health value so that all individuals have the opportunity to be healthy and thrive 365 days a year, every year. And I'll leave you with a quote that I'm sure some of you are very familiar with. If you wanna go fast, go alone. And if you wanna go far, go together. Thank you. I'd like to now introduce Betty Lynn Fisher, a medical reporter and consumer columnist with the Akron Beacon Journal and the USA Today Network to moderate the remainder of this session. Great, hello. Thank you, Rita, for that great presentation. Um, and uh, thank you to Neomed for um, inviting me. This is our last um, in the series and I have been um, the fill-in for WKYC's Monica Robbins um, as she had um, her second surgery for brain, um, a brain tumor. She's back at work, she's back um, doing well and looking forward to taking this back on in the fall and I will be happy to be her backup. Um, so there is a um, open question and answer um, box if you have any questions that you'd like uh, me to ask Rita and I will try to get to them all. Um, Rita, actually one of the questions that I was jotting down as you were, you were talking was something that you um, addressed right at the end, which was, you know, think about how, how much more work could be done if there were, there were other organizations like this. So I'm just curious, are there other similar collaborative collaborations similar to yours across the state? Um, and then nationwide. Yes, yes, there definitely are. Um, there are actually three collaboratives like, like ours um, in the state of Ohio. Uh, one is in Columbus and one is in Cincinnati. And yes, we often work at a statewide level uh, together. Sometimes we do our statewide learning collaboratives. We actually have one on June 21st teed up uh, in Columbus at the Grand Event Center. Um, and there's a national organization um, that exists called Civitas Network, and that they bring about 35 to 40 uh, regional health improvement collaborative organizations like ours together from across the country. Again, all in the spirit of sharing best practices um, and learning from one another. Often we'll do webinars or sometimes a national conference uh, together. Great. Um Let's go to a couple of questions from um, the audience. So what is your leadership style or style and has it changed over your career? Well, that's interesting. Um, so I would say to you, I probably have always been a collaborative leader uh, in one way, shape, form or another. Um, and even through, you know, you have different environments that you can work in, but collaboration I think is something that, um, you know, you're either sort of wired that way or you're not. Uh, so even in, in general days when I was director of nursing or a site administrator, typically what that involves is, is being very inclusive and working with uh, lots of different people, diverse people, bringing them together to solve issues, whether that's a, an issue that you're trying to solve, let's say in the quality of care you deliver every day to patients or problems that come up within a team. You know, if you have a collaborative style, then you're kind of used to solving these things together. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that's more of my natural tendency than it is a sort of command control, uh, you know, more of an authoritative style. Sure. That goes into a couple questions about collaboration. Um, one is, what are the principles of collaboration that work best and what doesn't work? Yeah, that I think I would say to you that um, one of the things that make us very successful is that we're very, um, we're very trusted. So you first have to really be able to uh, establish trust and you do that somewhat through establishing credibility first. So you have to hold us very high bar on integrity, on follow-up, be results-driven, be accountable for what you wanna do. Um, 
But again, it, you know, every person who comes to the table, you want to respect their ideas. No idea is a bad idea. You want to hear them, listen to them. They come to a table so that they have a, a way for their collective voices to be heard, their thoughts to be heard and listened to. And we let them lead. We let our partners lead. We're, we call it, we kind of pride ourselves on we lead from behind. And so we don't want to take the credit for what they're doing. We're just enabling them to, to be able to move forward. We might give them some project management tools. We certainly can give them the data that helps inform their work. But at the end of the day, they trust us. They've, we've built that trust over the years um, and they trust us to show up. They trust us to let them lead. They trust us to inform them with accurate and timely information and that we're going to help get them to results. Have you ever had a time where you needed collaboration and you couldn't get one key partner to collaborate? Um, and, and if so, what did you do? Yeah, we've had some, uh, <laughs> we've had some starts and stop. Um, and, and there's just been times when you have to sit back and you have to recognize that sometimes it's just not the right time. You know, people have, a lot of our partners have competing priorities. So for example, you know, during COVID, that would have been the wrong time to come forward and to say, you know, we want to work on um, in advancing improvements in, you know, some other, um, I don't know, uh, perhaps uh, uh, skin cancer screenings or something like that. It might have been like, great idea, Rita, but yeah, <laughs> we have, we've got some bigger priorities here. So you have to be patient. You have to be able to say, look, not it, you know, we, because it's a good idea doesn't mean this is necessarily the right time for that idea. Um, and it's like anything you do, right? You, you know how it is to plant a seed and then you go back and have to water that seed and then you water a little bit more and you water a little bit more. And maybe a year, two years from now, it's like somebody else comes up with that idea and everybody goes, great idea. Well, part of it was because you planted those seeds along the way and, and fertilized them. So Patience, I would say, is helpful. Okay. okay. What gets people excited about collaboration and, and why do they volunteer their time beyond their day jobs and you know to drive these better health improvements within their organizations? Yeah, so it's amazing to see the participation that we have from uh, all of our health systems and these other sectors that come together. I mean, we have structures in place that uh, our leadership teams, their member-led subcommittees and committees, and these folks meet monthly, if not more frequently. And, um, you know, this is something collaborating with their peers is something they can't necessarily do in their day jobs. And so when they come together, I believe they're coming together because they share a passion for making a difference, which I think a lot of people do probably on this call and want to make a difference. And they want to work with others in, in the best interests of the common good. And so when they come to the table, they have this unified purpose, if you will, that they're already uh, thinking about ways to go together, to go forward together. And not a lot of other places provide this opportunity for them to do that. Maybe a once a year conference, they get to come together and see each other and collaborate. But this is an ongoing, you know, small group meetings, leadership team meetings where they see each other on a monthly basis. I, a great example um, that I can share is when Cuyahoga County stakeholders decided it was time to really rally around infant mortality because Cuyahoga County had one of the worst infant mortality rates in the country. Um, we, Better Health Partnership, were asked to bring <clears throat> the large health systems together, the three big birthing hospitals together, and to start to work with them on trying to find modifiable interventions to help reduce extreme premature birth, which is the leading cause of infant mortality um, uh, in the county. And so we brought OBGYN clinicians together, maternal fetal medicine experts. We brought uh, neonatologists together. And the first thing I heard when we gathered them together was, we've been working in this community for 20, 30 years. 
we've never sat down together to solve problems together, to share information, to share best practices, and to learn from one another. They'd never done that. It amazed me. And together, they did find some areas they could improve on by using the data and sharing their best practices to help them improve in areas that might reduce extreme premature birth. And what was interesting is that when the funding stopped for them to do their part of this work, they wanted to continue to meet. And they continue to come to the table every month. They worked during COVID. They, fortunately, they had already been working together and they were able to produce uh, videos that the community could see to say, here's how you get care during this time when you're pregnant or you're a new parent. So they came together very quickly, produced those videos together. And now they're working on social determinant of health and, and social needs screenings <clears throat> with one another. So it's, it's really been interesting to watch and very rewarding to see. That's great. You actually touched on two questions um, that people have asked already, but so let me, I'm going to still ask this one because there's one part that, that, um, that you didn't answer, which is the infant mortality rate in Cuyahoga County is one of the highest in the U.S. Why is this rate so high? And then the person had asked, what, how have you addressed the issue? So you already discussed how you address the issue, but do you want to discuss why the rate is so high in Cuyahoga County? Well, I, I wish we could say that we figured that out. Um, but in, in addition to the work that our um, clinical group was doing in this space, there were 11 action teams that got formed under this umbrella of First Year Cleveland. And some of these other action teams worked on a variety of, of angles to try to get at this issue. So whether it was people focused on toxic stress with women, um, whether it was the patient experience of care and whether they were experiencing any kind of racial bias in the system, you know, they were, they were attacking this problem from multiple angles. And so what I would say to you is that the value of this collaboration was that we helped raise awareness with the provider community that these other factors also play a role and to get the, the social determinants um, better addressed in this situation. So that um, nobody has the, the magic wand or the silver bullet yet to fix this, but we know that we have made some strides. The infant mortality rate has come down in Cuyahoga County, but unfortunately the disparity between black babies and white babies has not closed. Mm -hmm. So we still need to get at that and we need to um, dig deeper. If you, speaking of that magic wand, if you had a magic wand to help your partners be even more effective in their collaboration with one another, what would, what would, what would that be? I would say to you, they need more time. <laughs> you know, if they had um, more time to come together and collaborate, I think we could have, um, more innovative ideas, we can have more participation and creating solutions for these complex kinds of issues. I know they would love to be freed up from their 17 minute patient care visit that Vitals um, bases itself on here and, and that they would uh, welcome the opportunity um, to be able to do that. I think they could also um, benefit from having more access to resources or maybe even a little more autonomy or authority in um, being able to get the data that they need um, to help inform their work and what would be useful to them. So again, often we have, they have to work through hierarchies and you know, other competing priorities and things like that. And I think if, if they could have these things, the better resources, the data at their fingertips, a little more cooperation um, from within, I think they could accelerate some of these improvements faster. You address this a little bit, but I want to bring it up again since there is a question. Um, see if there's more you want to uh, discuss about it. it. Says you don't hear much about big systems, which are also competitive, being willing to collaborate. How do you get them to trust each other and work together? Well, again, that's probably one of our best <clears throat> successes in all of this work. You know, back in in 2007, the way all of this got started was with a grant uh, from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. 
And that uh, grant was under the Aligning Forces for Quality Initiative. It was an eight year initiative and it was designed to do exactly what we've been doing. It, they funded 16 communities across the United States. And they said, you know, go out there, form partnerships, get people to uh, create some transparency in the region around quality of care um, using data for that and see if you can't have an impact on improving care, getting to better health outcomes and lowering costs. So like anything, you start out sort of small and we were fortunate that um, my predecessor at the time, Dr. Randy Siebel had a great relationship uh, with one of the largest health systems here in Northeast, Northeast Ohio who said, yeah, we're in, we're gonna give this a try, we're gonna be supportive. And then as, as any change management or movement happens, you get, you have your early adopters and then you work your way towards people that are sort of on the fence. And then sometimes you bring in those last people just because they don't want to be left out. Not necessarily that they want to be in, but they don't want to be left out. And so that has worked in some cases as well. But as we got traction, as we got results, especially as we got results, and we, we showcased those successes. That built, built more momentum. That built others coming to the table and saying, we, we think we want to be a part of this. We want to be able to do this kind of work as well. So I would say to you that um, you have to find what they value. You have to know what's important to them. And oftentimes, <clears throat> it's not about us going to them and saying, here's what we can do for you. It's what do you want to do? What's important to you? And how does this collaboration, working not just in your silo, but with others, how can that benefit you? How can that support what it is you're trying to accomplish? Next question is a comment and a question together. Um, it's surprising that healthcare systems and professionals seem so behind in some principles that are basic in business. Why is that so? I think they've come a long way in recent years, um, I do. And I think that the whole movement towards health value, right? And away from a fee for service system and paying for value. So you're no longer paying for throughput on things but you are paying for outcomes. Um, I would say the business community has been oriented to that for a long time, but um, I think healthcare is getting there. I just think that some of the systems that they've had in place have been a little more antiquated, you know, some of the data systems for sure, even some of our payers still have some pretty antiquated data systems, but they're getting, it. I mean, some of the, when we started collaborating back in 2007, uh, we were, we were showing primary care practices and even some larger health systems, you know, how to use electronic medical records and how to get data out of that. And that was only 15 years ago. So they have come a long way in terms of those improvements. Um, they, you know, now they have analytic shops that are, are excellent. You know, they're all on some kind of a continuum and a spectrum there, but, but, but clearly they have gotten very good at their own internal analytics. And, and that's caused our collaboration to say, Look, we, we had a pivot. We're no longer here to help them do that. They can do that on their own now. Mm -hmm. But do they know how to now use that information that they have together with public health, together with social data, right? To say, how do you look at your community that you're serving in a different way? And how do we advance those improvements together for the community? And that's how things have evolved. But I would tell you, I think they have come a long way um, from where we started 15 years ago uh, in terms of their systems and, and looking at things from a, from a business perspective. Speaking of public health, we have a question. What are some specific ways the partnership is working with the local public health departments to help solve these problems? Yeah, so we have um, some uh, great relationships with uh, the Cuyahoga County Board of Health, the Cleveland Department of Public Health, Summit County Public Health, Medina County, and we hope to, to keep expanding that. But so often, you know, some of these public health departments have to do community health assessments. And so if you think about, they have to do their own community health needs assessments, 
Hospitals have to do those needs assessments. So we are at the table helping to um, shape those assessments, to facilitate that work, but probably even more important is when they have to put the improvement plan together around that work. That's where we play a very large role. Um, and we have been what's been considered an anchor organization in Cuyahoga County for their health improvement um, plan in Cuyahoga County. And it's, it's a, uh, uh, basically we're the anchor for chronic disease management. So if you think about having to bring all the health systems to the table and to try to make advances in chronic disease management improvement, we've played a very instrumental role in that regard. You know, we're, we're working now with um, the Cleveland Department of Public Health. Uh, so we, one of the conditions we track in children is asthma, asthma diagnosis, um, and particularly the exacerbations with asthma, which can be very costly um, and certainly causes children to um, have a pretty high absenteeism rate from school. And we know that it's a controllable condition. So one of the things, it's, it's great that we can get them to the doctor and give them medications. And we deal with a lot of issues around that in and of itself. But if you think about air quality and where people live, you know, we, we are starting to, to bridge those gaps and to work with public health to say, you know what, how about you use our data and our improvement activities and combine it with where you're looking to do more air quality monitoring. And then let's work together to get more education out um, for the public and understand, you know, when, what kinds of things families can do to help mitigate some of that uh, that's going on with, with asthma control. The other area I would tell you is with lead, lead exposure, lead poisoning. Um, and certainly public health has a huge role with that, right? When you think about housing conditions and lead pipes and things of that nature, um, one of the things we bring to the table is well, that's not certainly the most upstream you can go on the preventive side is getting rid of that. But what about the clinicians and are they even led testing? Do they even know where their patients live? Are you even asking about their housing conditions? Are you seeing the zip code they live in and are you, are you interpreting that to say, oh, I should be asking this family about lead testing. And so we look at, well, you know, different providers, different health systems by practice level, by provider level, who's doing lead testing and who isn't? Well, are you even ordering the test? Are your patients getting tested? And then can we use that information to help target neighborhoods with together with public health on the prevention side to say, here are areas where we see pretty high risk low lead testing and we haven't done much on the remediation side. So again, bridging those sectors together to work more collaborative, collaboratively towards these solutions. Um, I should have asked you this earlier. So I think I heard you say that you, the collaborative um, encompasses about 17 counties. Can you talk about kind of your north, south, east, west boundaries of, of you know, where you, where the collaboration um, is involved? Sure. You know, our, our primary, where I would say we've had the most impact, of course, is Cuyahoga County, where we got our start, and I would follow that quickly by with Summit County, the Cleveland-Akron region. But we have practices that, that expand as, as far to Sandusky, to Erie, right down to Stark, Canton area. Um, and uh, we're, you know, here, obviously, in, in uh, Cuyahoga County um, for Cleveland. So we span quite a few counties. Um, we would like to be able to have a little more impact more broadly. And I would say that that would be an, an, like phase three or where we're going. Um, and so that involved that in order to do that, we would have to get even more uh, practices sharing their data. We'd have to make connections and new relationships with public health in those areas. And we think we're pretty well positioned to do that. Um, but again, we're, we've been very um, intentional and planful about how fast we grow. Because if, if, again, if we're not having the impact where we uh, have the, the best connections and relationships and data sharing, you know, we have to be able to build on that success to be able to move forward. Right. Um, next question. How do you teach collaboration to medical and pharmacy students? 
Yeah, well, um, I think we've been asked that question several times. Uh, it's, it's something I think that it needs to be embedded in curriculums. Um, you know, you need to think about community health and that's very different from the patient who's sitting in front of me in my practice at this moment and I'm assessing for health. One of the things that um, <clears throat> we offer is, you know, if there are experiences that some of the students want to have with community partners, we can help maybe facilitate some of those relationships so they can get some, some time um, to spend in those, in those areas, whether it's a public health department or it's a federally qualified health center that does an awful lot with minority populations and social determinants of health. You know, we can help to facilitate some of that experience. Um, I personally am a guest lecturer for um, Ohio University and their medical students who are in a special track for leadership in this area. And it's, it's fun to go and talk with them uh, and to see you know, to see them say, well, I never really thought about quality improvement in that regard. How do you apply it to a region? How do you apply it to a geography or a population? Because traditionally it's, it's about their own patients and, and the conditions that they're seeing in front of them. So I think we need to do a whole lot more of that. Open up that lens, you know, get them to think about multi-sector collaboration you know, the provider, the doctor, the nurse practitioner, whatever it is, doesn't need to solve this patient's issue alone, doesn't need to get that patient to better health outcomes alone. They can work with others, um, multidisciplinary approaches to getting there. Okay. Next question. Sounds like you have touched on social determinants of health. Can you talk about the areas of health disparity and public-private partnerships to address these issues? Yeah, so I think, you know, one of the things that um, we're seeing, obviously our, our health system partners in the last few years have said, okay, we need, to, um, we need to look at social determinants of health because we aren't moving the needle on health outcomes. So you heard me maybe say in my presentation, um, we have closed gaps in diabetes care. That's one thing. We've improved blood pressure control for all populations, but we did not, we have not been successful in closing disparities in those health outcomes for blood pressure. So we still see those, those gaps there. So one of the things that you know our health systems are saying is okay, these are persistent disparities. We we as primary care can probably only affect maybe 20% of a health outcome. Everything else tends to come from the social factors, things that happen further upstream. If somebody lives in poor housing, they have you know, uh, access to unhealthy food, um, they can't walk and get the exercise that they need. These are now the things that primary care is saying we have to pay attention to. And I think there are multiple ways that I, what I see anyway, that health systems are starting to address this with other sectors. You know, some systems say we want to build it all ourselves and you're literally putting in grocery stores within their own health systems, right? That's one, one angle. Others might say, no, I think we need to have a really tight working relationship, let's say with the food bank, right? And, and good systems to where we can get food delivered to our patients where we need to. So it's either through these public-private partnerships, or it could be through, I wanna build it ourselves. We wanna do it all ourselves. We wanna, we wanna own Uber and get and, and transportation for our patients so they get to every place they need to go, you know, or you partner for those things. And so um, I think they're just figuring this out now, but what's been interesting to me is that just, just pre-COVID, at one of our learning collaboratives, we had some senior population health executives uh, in a panel. And we asked the question, you know, who, who owns worrying about the social determinants of health for people? And the answers, as you can imagine, were rather varied. From we should be responsible, these are our patients, we should do everything possible to others saying, I I'm not so sure, it's our responsibility. Maybe it's somebody else's. 
But over the last few years, now again, partially incentivized by where the payment system goes, which I do believe is a big catalyst, we have seen them all embrace, we will do social determinant of health screenings with our patients. At least we're starting there. Let's see what the needs are. Then let's look at what the highest priority needs are. Then can we work with organizations, United Ways 211s. Um, we have a Pathways Community Hub now in Cuyahoga County, which there actually are 11 Pathways Community Hubs around Ohio. These, these use community health workers to help providers better manage their patients and get them connected to the resources that they might need. So it's been nice to see that evolution. Uh, many of them are starting to put in um, social referral platforms now. You may have heard of things like Unite Us or Healthify or Aunt Bertha. These are the platforms they're starting to use. So now I've not only identified my needs, but I have a way to at least refer them somewhere. And now we have to get out, well, what's working? What isn't working? And where might we need more resource if we have gaps out there um, in certain services? Where do we need to invest our, our money to, to build those resources in a community? And that's all partnerships. That is all public-private partnerships. Right. Um, next question is, you mentioned asthma as a modifiable risk factor worthy of intervention. Perhaps the most significant modifiable risk factor is addiction, tobacco, alcohol, opioids, and food obesity. Is your organization tackling these factors to improve or have positive impact on other chronic illnesses? Yeah, so I would say to you that, um, you know, in, in the adult space, we have not done a lot with addiction. Um, but in the children's space, we are, we, we have an active committee on that. And we have brought together um, primary care providers, behavioral health providers, payers. Um, we've brought actually all of the uh, public schools together between Cleveland and Akron to try and tackle mental and behavioral health needs in children. You probably heard me mention that, you know, in Ohio right now, suicide is the leading cause of death in our children ages 10 to 14 years old. That's just not acceptable. And we have to fix that. So again, we are working really hard here to say, how can we get Let's, we're going to start with saying, how can we get universal screenings, right, for mental health, behavioral health needs in place? Whether those screenings get put into primary care, whether they happen in behavioral health care providers' offices, whether they happen at the schools, can we get the universal screening going? And then once we get and identify those needs, we have to be able to do something with that information. We have to be able to refer someone. We need integrated data systems to be able to do that, effectively do that. We have found and learned through our work that there's patchwork going on everywhere with, between schools and providers to make that happen. And schools have spun up their own care teams, but we need them to get to talk to primary care and behavioral health providers in the community as well. So we're moving in that direction. We have a lot of people at the table trying to solve this. And our vision really is to say that for children, we have to think about wellness in children holistically. Their environmental health needs, their social health needs, their behavioral health needs, their physical needs, their dental needs for that matter. And we should have a fully integrated approach for those children to receive the help they need 365 days a year. No wrong door access. Not just a, this is a well visit this year, check the box with your primary care provider, right? These kids need help all year long. And that we are absolutely on that path with regard to our, with our children. We have a couple more minutes for a couple more questions. Thank you for answering all of these. And thanks to those of you who are, who are putting them in, if you have, a last minute question you want me to try to get to, please do. Um, another question, has collaboration been made more difficult by large system acquisition, acquisitions that disregard the valued work by smaller and independent hospitals? Well, that one's a good one. Um, <laughs> I would say that I haven't seen, well, I have seen temporary 
uh, I'll say temporary disruption, perhaps, right? Because anytime you have a, an acquisition, there's going to be disruption. I mean, they're just that's just the nature of how it how, how it goes. And we recently um, did lose a, a community-based health system uh, that had been collaborating with us for years and doing some very innovative work, became part of a larger health system. Um, but we know that they've got to go through their their transition phase, their process, and then we will come back. We will come back and we will begin to, again, show them why it's so important that what that smaller health system was doing um, can be done in the larger system and that we want them to come back to the table because otherwise we can't get to those populations in those regions. So yeah, I would definitely say that anytime there's an acquisition, there, there will be some level of disruption. Give equal voice to, um, you know, to the large, to the large players and the small players. There are still, you know, small independent um, organizations, um, and then there's, you know, the large ones. And so, how do you, how do you even that playing field, um, you know, when you're when you're at the table? You're right. Well, one of the things, you know, and we do have some independent providers out there still with running their practices. We love hearing from them because they will offer different perspectives every time about the same problem. And they don't have the resources, the plentiful resources to solve those. So they will often open our eyes at a table and, and, and the large systems respect that voice. I mean, we have seen this over and over and over again. And our federally qualified health centers are independent systems in a way, right? And they're smaller than the large um, hospitals, but They've learned how to serve, how to how to integrate social determinants of health with their healthcare delivery for a long time. So larger systems are learning from them. And on the other hand, large, you know, the large systems have a have a absolute purpose in our in our place. They can affect everything we're doing at scale pretty quickly. They can inform our work at scale very quickly. And because they have more resources, sometimes they may be ahead of the curve on some of these solutions and innovations as well. So this is an art, uh, this collaborative space is an art. And this is where that trust comes in that as the leader, as our group leads these kinds of neutral convenings, we must always be thinking about that balance. Everybody at that table needs to be heard. And we have to show how much we appreciate diverse perspectives around the same challenging health issues. We have a pharmacy question. Um, with pharmacists gaining provider status in Ohio, how can non-hospital pharmacies join in these system collaborations to make data-informed improvements to patient care? Well, I tell you, that's something we haven't really talked about at, at our collaborative, but my first reaction to that is, boy, I think they could be very helpful, especially if we could get some more pharmacy data available to us, right? And, and what do the pharmacists see again from their lens? When you think about, we know if a, if a provider has perhaps ordered a medication, let's, let's, let's look at the, as, the asthma that we talked about with kids. You know, maybe a controller drug has been ordered, but how do we know it's been filled? How do we know they're using it? How do we know it's affordable? The doctor often doesn't go beyond that prescription that's been written. The pharmacist could help us understand that. Where are those gaps? Why aren't those being filled? Are there certain neighborhoods? Again, we could look at things from a population health perspective where we might then target certain neighborhoods. And so I think it'd be very valuable to have them at the table. Um, and, in, and anybody who has an interest in talking more about that, I'm, I'm available. Great. Um, I think this is probably an appropriate last question, and then I'll send it back to Dr. Langell. Um, what are the big projects on the horizon for Better Health Partnership? Well, um, sadly, as I said, our, our work will continue until, you know, we can close some of these uh, disparity gaps, especially, right? So you've got infant mortality that we have not, we haven't curbed yet. The behavioral health and kids, huge for us. Closing uh, disparity gaps and health outcomes with our adult populations front and center. We also know um, that we want to work on helping our federally qualified health centers transition to um, 
value-based care and delivery, which is something very new and different for them. And we run the Pathways Community Hub here in um, Cuyahoga County. And so uh, again, getting to more populations, the value of the community health workers and what they can add to either clinical teams for our healthcare systems or how they can have more impact at a neighborhood level. We are um, growing that and scaling that um, as we speak. Great, well, thank you very much, Rita. Um, I'm going to send it back to Dr. Langell. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Betty. And as always, thank you for your expert moderation. Rita, thank you for your leadership and the incredible impact that you're having in our communities with Better Health Partnership. Really, this is an amazing conversation, and I think all of us have learned a great deal on what you're doing and what we can do differently. For our audience, we are going to take a hiatus from Vitals until next December, as we do each year. I invite you to come to neomed.edu forward slash vitals if you missed part of today's presentation or if you would like to review any of the presentations from our past two seasons. Vitals has been an incredible program and we're excited that it's going to continue into the future. Remember, all of you can be transformational leaders at every level. level. So please, Take what you learned today and what you've learned at all of the Vitals presentations, stay engaged, be active, and advocate for change. Thank you again. Health outcomes, changes due to interventions. To bring positive change, patient experiences and health must both improve. Healthcare costs must be lowered and clinician and staff burnout has to end. But our problems are big. 133 million Americans have at least one chronic disease. Half a million people are dying every year from hospital errors, injuries, and infection. The shortage of primary care professionals will be as much as 100,000 in just the next five years. Big problems require bigger solutions. Positive change needs acceleration. It needs to happen now. But these are not so easy solutions that many don't want to hear, and even few are willing to talk about. How to lead such a change? How to discover, discuss, and disrupt healthcare to make a difference now? This is Vitals, visionary health leadership in action.